Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Digital Media E10. This is week six when we get to talk about the histogram. And it's really kind of amazing to find out that there's just so much stuff that we're going to be able to talk about the histogram uh, in just a few minutes. But first, I wanted to finish off some of the uh, topics from last week that we didn't get a chance to really discuss in any detail. So at the very end of last week, we finished the uh, discussion about optics, talking a little bit about filters. And very quickly, you might have seen uh, this size on a slide representing a symbol, or it's a filter size symbol that represents the size typically of the filter itself. Now, the symbol itself obviously doesn't indicate the size, but you typically see on a lens the size that is indicated with that symbol. So on this particular lens, we can see that symbol followed by 67 millimeters, which tells you if you go to amazon.com or maybe bhphoto.com and uh, try to purchase a filter, that's typically the size that you're going to need. And typically these filters will come in a variety of different styles and capabilities, but some of the most popular ones that you are likely to encounter as a still digital photographer are one of these. So you might have a neutral density filter, for example, which as we discussed very briefly last week, you can sort of think of as sunglasses for your lens because it darkens all of the light coming into the lens, but it does so in a way that's more optically pure than sunglasses. And in fact, many neutral density filters are more expensive probably than uh, some of the sunglasses you might go and purchase for yourself. But really all these are meant to do is to try to decrease the intensity of the light that are coming in in an even fashion across all of the visible wavelengths. And this is a very important thing. You don't want to try to introduce any color cast into your image by having a neutral density filter that isn't in fact neutral. And so the whole point of doing this is so that you would be able to decrease the sensitivity or decrease the number of photons entering into your camera so that you can then do something with that effect. So if, for example, you wanted to try to take a photograph with a very long exposure in the middle of the day, you might be limited by the aperture in your, in your lens. You might be limited by the shutter speed um, in your camera. And specifically at ISO 100 and at the smallest possible aperture in your lens, you might still get shutter speeds that are relatively fast. And you want to try to slow down those shutter speeds to try to capture movement, especially in moving water or perhaps in some other context where you want to capture a, a slower movement in a daylight photograph. And using a neutral density filter in this way really allows you to do that. So there's uh, that element of a neutral density filter which would allow you to increase the duration that a shutter is open. You can change the shutter speed, but also you might want to use it so that you can use a wider aperture as well. And that is certainly another uh, reason that you might want to use this. Now there's there's also the neutri neutral density filters come in a variety of factors. They don't just come in some specific level of darkness. You can buy some at a relatively low factor that only decreases the amount of light entering into the lens by a stop or two. Or you might find some that can uh, decrease that light by far more stops, maybe five or six stops or something along those lines and really get a much bigger impact out of that neutral density filter. I recommend that you take a look at that if you're interested in using that and uh, in, in adding it to your arsenal of possibilities with your digital camera. Um, there are other types of neutral density filters as well, like a graduated neutral density filter, which is essentially a neutral density filter on one end and purely transparent on the other. And there is a little bit of a gradient between one and the other of varying degrees of sharpness. But generally this is used so that you can try to balance out a very uh, harshly lit scene, in particular for landscapes when you have a very bright sky at, at sunset, for example, and a very dark uh, landmass below the horizon, you would place the, uh, the gradient right across the horizon and try to, um, to average out those, uh, those exposures between the, the very differently illuminated portions of the image. Now that is a way that you would be able to um, try to fix some exposure issues in a very difficult to, um, difficult to expose shot at the scene, but there's also ways that you could do this in software as well. You could take a variety of different shots at different exposure levels and then later on combine them using some sort of masking techniques uh, at a later point in time. Really depends on what it is that you're going for, how 
frankly, how cheap you are and how much time you want to spend setting up your shots and a variety of other factors uh, that, that go into this particular decision. Next week, we're going to talk a bit about software tools, and we're going to do so in a, in a much more uh, practical way than the initial discussion about software tools, which is a bit more abstract and talking about um, different terminologies and different types of software tools that are available. But instead, we're going to start to look at Adobe Photoshop and perhaps Adobe Lightroom and how we can do a variety of popular and useful uh, modification techniques like masking to composite multiple images together. So look forward to that next week and you'll find out that this is actually also relevant to your project three, which we'll talk about in just a little bit of time. So another type of filter that exists is a circular polarizer. And a polarizing filter is <clears throat> does, a, does a fantastic job of uh, changing the, the contrast, especially of, of colors within a scene. So we have here uh, on the right side of this, of this slide two different photographs, one without a circular polarizer and one with a circular polarizer, and uh, e uh, no amount of contrast or saturation changes done in software besides the fact that there was this additional filter. You can see the impact that it has on this image. It really allows some of these images to pop. And one of the things you'll notice about a circular polarizer that you may not necessarily have on other filters, though it really depends on the type of filter, is that you can actually place a circular polarizer on top of the lens and it will rotate. You can actually rotate it to try to align the polarization to different levels. And p talking about some polarization of, of light is, is it, it becomes surprisingly uh, nuanced and complicated, as you can imagine, as anything when we're talking about physics. But there's an easy way to perhaps think about this. And one of them is that um, uh, polarized light essentially is the, the direction or the angle of the, of the wave propagation of that light through, through space. And we talked a bit about this sort of wave particle duality of light very early on in the course. Um, and if we imagine for a moment that light does behave as a wave, then you can imagine that that wave has a, has a particular direction of its movement. And really, when we're talking about polarization, we are talking about that angle. What is the angle that that light is actually propagating uh, its, its, um, its wave? And that's different than the direction of propagation of light. Because if you imagine that light is propagating from one side to the other, from your right to your left, you can imagine that a wave might propagate up and down. You might imagine that a wave might propagate towards you and away from you all along this direction of travel. And these are different polarizations of this light. But this is an oversimplification of uh, polarization because there's also this 3D component as well. And it can also po polarize in certain circular fashions as well. And so a lot of the polarizers that you might encounter like the ones here, and, and the ones that we use typically for uh, digital photography are known as circular polarizers. Because they might actually impact the light. You can actually think of it in terms of this sort of linear, linearly polarized light, which is perhaps propagating a wave motion in one particular direction like this. But once it has polarized that light, in other words, once it has allowed only certain uh, angles or certain polarizations allowed through the, that filter, does it then repolarize it to uh, benefit the, the camera? So in other words, there's, there's a little bit of a trick here that these polarizers do is that the filters themselves, given the angle that you rotate that filter, will uh, prevent certain angles of this polarized light from entering into that filter. You can think of it sort of like that. But once that light has then entered through that filter, it is then repolarized. Uh, and it is, well, it's not really, that's not exactly what's happening, but it's sort of polarized in a more random fashion. And the reason for that is that if you polarize the light and prevent only certain polarized light from entering into the camera, if you have a, linear, a linearly polarized filter, for instance, you might block all of the light in a particular orientation, in a particular uh, propagation from entering into the filter, but you would actually see that the camera then has difficulty using autofocus or metering in certain orientations of that filter, just because it's expecting um, 
and again, there's a lot of hand waving and simplification that's happening here. It might be expecting certain types or certain polarization of that light. So a circular polarizer gets around this by first polarizing the light that enters into it, or in other words, it is uh, ensuring that only light with a certain uh, orientation is being allowed through the filter, and then it repolarizes, or it sort of randomly scatters it, or it sort of provides this sort of circular polarization to it so that a camera would then be able to regain its functions. So polarized light, when it is reflected off of, or rather non-polarized light, when it is reflected off of something like water, for instance, becomes polarized. And so we, you can see the impact of a, of a polarizing filter most especially in cases where light is being reflected off something like water. Because normally the light is being reflected off of some water and you see that light being reflected. But that light is now polarized and so if you orient the polarizing filter in such a way that those, that particular orientation of polarization is blocked, you can then sort of see through that topmost layer of water. It's actually very fascinating to put on a circular polarizer and just point it at something and twist and see what happens. There's other types of filters as well. There's um, haze and UV filters which attempt to block those particular wavelengths and particular UV wavelengths from entering into your lens. Some people also swear by them as protectors for lenses. There are a glass element on the front of your lens that protects the, the, the lens elements themselves from injury. And there's something to be said about this in that Sure, if you accidentally drop your lens and you crack this filter, then that doesn't really matter all that much. You've lost a $60 filter rather than a $600 lens. But there's also the, the fact that you're placing a filter in front of that lens, and by nature of placing a piece of glass in front of this lens, you're going to decrease the amount of light that's entering into it. So some amount, no matter how, many, how much special coating this filter has to, happens to have, it's still going to be reflecting a little bit of light and it's going to be decreasing the amount of light that enters into your camera. Typically we would say that just placing a filter in front of your, in front of your lens would offer a decrease in light of about a third of a stop or so, but probably that varies quite a bit depending on the quality of the filter. You might notice uh, more than that or you might not notice a change in the uh, raw exposure values on your camera, even if it is some subtle difference. Just by nature of this fact that we have these uh, additional layers of glass, we're going to be decreasing the amount of light entering into the optics. There's another issue as well, which is that you have, you're placing a filter on the front of this glass element, and you have now uh, changed, you've now increased the number of interfaces that this light has to travel through. So if you have light entering into the filter and then reflecting off of the glass, the front elements on your lens, then it can reflect yet again off the filter and come back. So you might actually notice that with some filters you have some additional internal reflections that you might not see normally. So if you notice that you enjoy having UV filters on your lenses because you like the protection that they offer. You should certainly spend the money to try to get good quality ones so that they minimize these reflections and they maximize the transmittance of light as much as possible. But if you notice that you're in a certain situation, perhaps you have, you're taking a photograph of some street lights, for example, and those have a very high contrast compared to the rest of the scene, you might notice some additional internal reflections and you might occasionally want to remove that filter. So it's just a cautionary word uh, about, about filters, even though many of them do offer a fantastic amount of um, additional capabilities to your photography and to your, um, and to your arsenal. Any questions on this? Okay. So just a couple of assignment reminders as we normally do at the beginning of class. Project two is due today, so congratulations on finishing that or hopefully very nearly so. Um, problem set three is due next Thursday, so if you've been working and focusing on your project two, then that's great. Don't, uh, don't worry about it um, too much. Just do, do go ahead once uh, this weekend, perhaps take a look at problem set three, get that in by next Thursday. Project three is released today and I wanna to talk just a little bit 
um, about this. Oh, and in general, um, I want to mention something about the, um, the submission tool. So all of you have been using the submission tool, and, and thank you for uh, doing that on time and getting everything in on time. Um, we are noticing uh, that a fair number of you might be submitting Word documents or text files rather than PDFs. So do be sure that you pay attention to uh, the, the expected submission types when you submit them to us. There's some translations and conversions going on in the back end that will frequently fail if you don't submit the correct type of photo or correct type of file to us. Uh, so we're emailing you individually if we do notice a problem, but uh, please do try to submit either a PDF if asked for that or a JPEG or the, just the appropriate file type to minimize problems with, uh, with your particular submission. So with that said, um, Project 3 is released today, and it is unlike the other projects. And this is sort of a trend that you might have noticed. All of the projects are very different from each other. But this one is unique in a very different way in that it is the only um, group project for this class. And there's a very good reason why we wanted to do a group project. We, uh, a few years ago, we started this project, and um, we were really not sure if this was sort of the way to go because it, it can be annoying, perhaps, in a distance class to try to get a group together and uh, um, organized and have a successful project. But really, there's, a, there's really only one element of this that is a group project, which is that sometime in the next two weeks, you will find a group of two or three people and exchange photos in that group. So there's two essentially independent components in this project that in the middle are, there's, there's this required component of, of, an, of an exchange with someone else. And that's, that's the point of, of this group project, is not to necessarily work in a group uh, it just to, in a, in a contrived way, to create some sort of photographs as a, as a group. It's not that at all. But instead to realize that when we take photographs, and hopefully you're starting to realize this also as you post your photos on the blog and, uh, and get critiques in sections, there's a lot of value to getting third-party um, feedback on your photographs that you, that you take. And many of you might have started noticing that as you work on projects, um, you are perhaps uh, approaching this conundrum that, that I find myself having a lot when I am working on photographs. And that is that I'm working on them and it becomes, I become too engaged with those photographs or I become too emotionally connected with how I took this one particular photograph. And so I really want it to be successful even though perhaps objectively it's not the best photograph. And so it's better to have this third-party review of your photographs and sort of get a sense of which ones are working and which ones are not, which ones work in sort of a grand scheme or which ones work really well as individual photographs. And we're doing this a little bit in the critiques, except that you are still picking the photographs to submit for critique. And this project, on the other hand, is meant for you to take about 100 photographs, or at least 100 photographs, and submit those to an, another person in your group, that is your quote-unquote editor. And you as uh, an editor will also get 100 photos from someone else inside of your group. And so the point here is then to exchange this, this group of photographs, and now the editor takes these 100 photographs and whittles them down to a selection of only five and performs the final modifications, including any minor modifications like cropping or saturation modifications, contrast, anything of the like to even more grand visions of doing composites or any sort of major modifications to the photograph, whatever the, the editor sees fit. But the whole point here is to sort of get a renewed look at your own photographs and to say, okay, I've taken these 100 photos. Maybe these are five that I would select out of this, out of this, uh, out of this series of photographs. Provide that to your editor. And your editor might say, well, you know what, that sounds, that's, that's great. And I agree that some of these photos are great. But I also really like this one instead and try to remove some of the emotional attachment that you might have when you were taking that series of photographs. So we suggest that you approach this in, in the following way. In the next week or so, take as many photos as you can. And by next Thursday, try to select about 100 of those. And by then, mean, in the meantime, try to find a group of one or two other people that can serve as your editors. And 
If you have a group of two, it becomes very easy. You two just simply communicate, exchange these 100 photographs. Each of you will take 100 photographs. Next week, you will like, then exchange them. Or if you're in a group of three, you could rotate. The th person A could pass their photographs to person B. Person B can pass the photographs to person C and C back to A. And then you have this circle of um, editing that can take place. And then in the second week, we then take those 100 photographs and then edit them. So this is sort of an ongoing experiment that we're doing with this, uh, with, with this group project. But there are two distinct independent parts. And really, you only need the group for this exchange of photographs in the middle. But it is very important also to schedule this, this group collaboration in a good way. In other words, it's, you probably want to have a group as quickly as possible. If you attend sections, that's a great way to meet some, uh, to meet some people and try to obtain a group. If you are unable to attend sections uh, for whatever reason, you can post on the blog. and just you, So in addition to being able to post photographs, you can also just post little snippets of text. Just post a little bit of text saying, I'm looking for, some, for, for a group. My email address is this. Please email me if you're interested. That might be a good way to go. If you don't have, if you cannot find group members by the end of the weekend, um, then please email us, uh, staff at dme10.org, and we will then connect you sort of on the back end with other people that have not found a group. But please, please, please be sure that you do this sooner rather than later so that in the next week or so you can at least start communication with your group and say, okay, well, I will get you the 100 photos. Um, by next Thursday or something along those lines. Then you can also agree how that exchange will take place and a variety of other things. Read the project specification for some additional recommendations and details on how that will work. Are there any questions on this? So there's also one other thing I want to mention about this project which is unique compared to some of the other projects, which is that um, you can, if you wish, use up to 20 images from past, uh, from the past, um, but it has to be images that you have taken during this class. So beginning, oh gosh, when do we even start? In the beginning of September or so, up until now, you can submit some of those photographs, but they also cannot be photographs that you have submitted as part of a project, problem set, or critique. So anything that you sort of worked on in the past, but you decided, eh, I don't really know if I want to use this, that's fair game up to 20 images for this, um, for this project as well. So again, take a look at the project specification. I know you're just finishing up with project two, and that's totally fine. You know, when you're done with that, maybe get a good, nice, good night's rest, take a look tomorrow evening or something. But just be sure that you, at least for now, try to get some group members um, ready for, uh, in anticipation of completing your project three. So one other announcement I want to make is that uh, there is a small change to one of the online sections. All of the times of the sections remain the same, but Henry's section on Saturday at 1 p.m., which is again the same time, is now going to be on Adobe Connect rather than on Skype. Uh, there's a variety of reasons for this, but one reason that we are making this change is to make it easier to record the section and offer it to people who are not able to attend any of the sections. We've had a couple of requests for this, um, and we are hoping that we will be able to uh, improve the amount of accessible material by, by doing this. this. This link will bring you to that section on Saturdays. This is only for Henry's Saturday section. Uh, you can also find it on the course website. We updated the website earlier today to point to this. So just to remind you, on Wednesdays at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, Shelley's section will continue to be on Skype. But the only change here is the Saturday 1 p.m. section will be on Adobe Connect. OK? Yes? Just to clarify, the, the photos that we are actually submitting are the ones we edit, not the ones we take. So the, the question is, the, for project three, I think, the photos that you're actually s submitting are the photos you edit and not the ones you took. That is correct. There is a small exception, which is that we don't want your 100 photographs. Um, it's, it's just too many, frankly. But we do ask that you compile, compile them into a contact sheet. A contact sheet is, and there's again more details in the specification for you to take a look at, and we also provide an example. A contact sheet is essentially a PDF document. You can think of it like a, 
uh, sort of a, a Word document for images or um, something along those lines. And each page, as part of this document, has small thumbnails, about 12 images or so on each page. And so that way we just get a sense of the images. We don't want the, all of them in full resolution, but it's sort of like looking at a, at a, uh, a bunch of negatives from a film roll when you could sort of see, you could get a sense of the entire roll just by looking at the entire roll. Um, we just sort of want that in a single contact sheet just to ensure that you submitted 100, um, but also just to get an overall sense of what it was that you submitted. So you submit your own contact sheet. That was your work, your 100 photos. And then you submit the five photos that you edited from someone else's collection of 100. Again, more details in the specification, but hopefully that clarification helps that aspect out. Any questions? All right, the histogram. So a histogram is essentially just a graph that counts the frequency of something or the number of occurrences of some particular thing. So this is a histogram uh, blatantly copied from Wikipedia, uh, which shows the, a distribution of s the heights of some cherry trees out of a population of some cherry trees. And so we have, we can see here that cherry trees between 75 and 80 feet have the highest representation with 10 trees being accounted for here. And this is really all that a histogram is, is that it tells you for some particular value along this x-axis, it tells you how much of that value you have. And you generally put these into buckets. And that, those buckets are these things along the, the, the bottom, uh, bottom x-axis. So the bucket from 60 to 65 feet of height, we see that we have three trees. The bucket from 65 to 70, we see we have three. 70 to 75, we see we have nine so on and so forth. And so in a similar vein, do we have a histogram that shows us roughly the tones of the image, in, uh, of the image just in a numeric and more, uh, I suppose, a more uh, quantifiable way. So this histogram is a representation of the tones or the, the, presence, the, the, the presence of those tones within your image as it ranges all the way from black at the far left all the way to pure white at the far right. And then we have to have this sort of wishy-washy count of some, for the, if there's a bar is very low, all the way up to many if we have a very high bar in this histogram. Now you might say, well, why don't we know specifically how many pixels we actually have? And we'll describe why in just a minute that it has to be sort of relative heights. But just for now, this is basically what a histogram is. And you can use this to make sure that your exposure is ap appropriately correct. If you have like a scene of snow, for instance, you probably want that scene to trend a little bit higher in the histogram just to represent all of the white pixels that are probably present in your photograph, so on and so forth. So that might seem like it, right? It's like, okay, cool, we talked about histograms. You know, turn it on on your camera, it's pretty great. Go home, we're done. Well, not quite. And a lot of the trickiness comes out of this simplification, which is, first of all, the y-axis on the left, this sum to many. Why is it not absolute? And the other trickiness is this discussion of black to white. How do we actually know, what does it mean to be in the middle? How do we, what does it mean for something to be gray if our photos are, in fact, uh, color? So let's first take a look at some really, really simple examples. So we have here a photograph that is completely underexposed. Really, it's just a bunch of black pixels in a, in a square. And we can see the histogram that results. We have no representation of pixels anywhere except in the very farthest leftmost column, which is a count of the black pixels in this image. Take a look here. It's actually pretty interesting. This is a, a screenshot from uh, Adobe Photoshop's histogram, which provides some numeric hints as to what's going on in this histogram. We can actually see the number of pixels in this image, 250,000, so there's only so many, uh, there's, there's a certain width and height here, but it's certainly not, it's not a very big picture. This is what, 500 by 500 pixels or something like that. But hopefully this now makes sense, right? And so you can imagine what this histogram would look like if it was completely white, which is that we would have a full height um, 
spike all the way on the right side of that histogram. But what does a histogram look like for a standard photograph, which of course has more subtle gradients and tones, and as we actually capture it and in some sort of well-exposed way, how, do we, how can we use this histogram to benefit our own photography? Well, it's useful to not rely on the LCD on the back of the camera because depending, the, your, your viewing of that image on the back of a camera when, as you might recall, of our use of the term chimping, when you're chimping over your camera, you know, acknowledging that, that image and admiring it, it is heavily dependent on the, the brightness of the screen and also the environmental light around you that uh, will determine whether or not you're actually viewing that in some sort of accurate way. And most likely, you are not viewing it in a way that is actually representative of how that image will look in a controlled environment. Like when you bring your images home, load them onto your computer, and all of a sudden you realize, gosh, you know what? These photos that I took at night looked properly exposed when I looked at them at the back of my camera. But now that it's in a properly lit room with a proper uh, brightness on my monitor, I notice that they're actually really, really dark. Or maybe vice versa. You're in a very brightly lit area, and you notice that the, it looks appropriately bright on your camera, but it actually is not. So. You can try to use the histogram to determine if the photos are under or overexposed, but it's really important to realize that there's not one histogram that represents a well-exposed photograph. And the reason for that is the photographs that we take are extremely varied in what actually counts for an appropriate histogram. So here we can see we have a, a, a spread of tones across a, a histogram. On the very far left, we can see that there doesn't seem to be very many very black pixels in this image, which we can actually see by looking at the image itself. We can also see that, the, that according to the histogram, there don't seem to be any regions that are overly bright, that have any pure white pixels. But we do see that there are some bright regions, and we do see a pretty significant spike for, that, uh, um, for some region in this image. And you can probably guess that that one spike is this darker blue area here, which represents the bulk of the tones, and hence that one spike in sort of the left third of this image. And we can see the, the sand that makes up the remainder of this image in the right side of that. And although we do have some bright areas in this image, none of these are actually pure white. So we don't actually see anything in the very extreme right of the histogram. And generally, this is a good thing to look out for. You want to have tones that fit within the capabilities of the camera. So pure black, uh, if we had some image that was just completely black, we would know that this is perhaps underexposed because all of the pixels are black and we weren't able to capture anything. Likewise, we might know that some regions are overexposed if we have some huge spike on the white end of that histogram as well. But again, it's tricky. Um, for a variety of reasons, which hopefully will become a little bit more clear. So one of these, one of, so this histogram I actually really like because it fits well within the possible ranges of this camera. I, I see that I really don't have any areas of extreme underexposure or extreme overexposure that I have to worry about. In fact, I could perhaps change the saturation and contrast a little bit to perhaps try to widen this histogram a little bit more and make it a little bit more uh, contrasty, make the black areas a little bit blacker, the white areas a little bit whiter. There's some latitude in this histogram for me to perform that particular modification. But not all photos are going to be in situations like this. Take this one, for, for instance, where just by looking at it, you might say that this is at risk of overexposure. In fact, there are some regions that are perhaps at risk of overexposure, and we can see that Perhaps even though there's this tapering off in the histogram at the very extreme bright ends, there, are, there is still just this sort of little tiny bump at the far right end of this histogram representing some pixels that are at risk of being overexposed. But we'll see why in just a minute why these histograms are actually somewhat difficult to uh, um, be used 
purely for exposure reasons. We'll talk about more, that, more about that in just a second. But what we can see is that perhaps some of the regions of this photograph that are at risk are the darker ones. There are perhaps some areas that are, in fact, a bit underexposed, which on this projector you can sort of see are perhaps the plains regions down at the very bottom, where we don't have as much texture or as many illuminated pixels as we might actually want. So you'll notice that we have some peaks in histograms that actually change very rapidly depending on the style of photograph that you're taking. When the important thing to realize is that, as we alluded to before, the heights of these peaks are relative. So they are relative to each other. So if you have some region of a photograph that is predominantly overexposed or predominantly underexposed, that's going to push the peaks down elsewhere in that histogram, making it a little bit more difficult to identify subtleties in the tones elsewhere in that histogram. Let's take a couple more examples to see what I mean by that. So here is another photograph where perhaps the range of light available in the scene might have exceeded a little bit the capabilities of this camera. <clears throat> There's some regions that are really dark and we can see a big spike on the far left. There's some regions that are really bright as we can see on the far right. And the, the spikes throughout the rest of this histogram are not as prominent as they were in some of the previous ones. That again is due to this relative height that we would see in this image or that we would see um, in the scene. So this photograph, this histogram, shows us that we have a really wide tonal range in the scene that we are trying to capture. And if we were taking this photograph out in the field and we were looking down and it's obviously some difficult lighting situation, we might try to intervene in some way to fix any issues of exposure here. Now, arguably, I have fixed the, uh, the, the issues with, of exposure in this photograph by covering them with a big black banner and putting a word and histogram on it, because really the major problems are, exist in the far upper left part of this particular image. And I like this image. I think it's actually, I think it's actually fine uh, with the, uh, the exposure problems that it has. Given the difficulty of getting to this spot, I also don't really know what else I could have done. I wasn't really carrying a reflector or anything of the kind. But of course, um, hindsight is 2020, and so perhaps it would have been a benefit to carry, I don't know, a sheet to this river in Norway, had I known, to be able to try to alleviate some of the problems of exposure. But anyway, this is a long-winded discussion to tell you that there's no one histogram that is going to be correct. You cannot look at a histogram without the context of the image and be able to say, oh yeah, I know, this photograph is totally, definitely, for sure, underexposed. How do you know that it wasn't a low-key photograph where it was very intentional that the background of that image is, predominates and there's a very small region of that photograph that has some texture that's actually visible? So here's another example where I would say that perhaps it's intentional that we have some regions that are overexposed, where it's not quite the... Um, we do want texture in the clouds, but we have to also acknowledge that there are that it is a predominantly white scene in this case with, with regard to the amount of the clouds relative to the, the rest of it. And even more strikingly, we can see these examples in our discussion of low-key and high-key photographs where we have huge spikes in the, rep in, the, uh, in the representative ends and the other spikes throughout the histogram are pushed down in effect because of this relative height difference. So be careful is, is the thing that we're trying to get at here, which is that you don't want to look purely at the histogram without also looking at the context of the photograph to understand if that histogram represents a well-exposed photograph or not. But where it does become in handy is to know if you are making some modifications to your photograph in, in time, whether or not those modifications are going to be successful. So we can look at a photograph like this, which is what we used when we were discussing our exposure compensation, and we can then try to determine whether or not our photograph was properly exposed. So it just so happens that I know my camera now, now having used it a fair amount, and I know that in this particular scene it was going to 
underexposed the sand that was present. So using the histogram was a great way to increase the exposure compensation while making sure that we didn't go too far without overexposing the entire scene just by watching the movement of those spikes as we increased the exposure compensation. So it can really help by making, making metering a little bit more clear and give you direction as to which way you need to push the exposure. Now, arguably, we could even say that knowing the context of this image, which is a lot of white sand, looking at the major spikes here, we could see that, OK, you know, maybe it's, in fact, a little bit too dark. But again, we wouldn't be able to look only at that histogram and say, oh, yeah, for sure, this is underexposed without knowing that context. So I've kind of been tricking you a little bit because it sounds really easy. And in fact, it is. But really, of course, like with anything, the devil is really in the details. So we've been looking at histograms that explore luminance, or it's the relative brightness of various colors and tones within the image. But there's different types of histograms that can show us different things. And it really depends on what it is that we're looking at that we need to know which histogram is going to be most representative. Generally speaking, we can safely use luminance histograms as representative uh, ways to ensure that our exposure is correct. But they lead us astray slightly when we're trying to determine if we have overexposed -exp specific colors. And I'll show you why in just a minute. So first, though, it's important to bring back our discussion of bits and bytes. So we talked about this very early on, and I said, here's, a, here's an introduction to how uh, we store some files and, and uh, how digital cameras compute their the things that they compute and so on and so forth. But really now, starting today, we, are we going to start to use some of this information to understand why we have these differences in histograms? So just as a refresher, we have a bit, which is either a 0 or a 1. We have a byte, which is a collection of 8 bits. And so we said that a byte can store so many different values. So how many different values can we store in a byte? 256, yeah, because we have 8 bits. So uh, a single bit can represent two values. So 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, so on and so forth, 8 times is 256 total values. But really, this counts. This goes from a value of 0. 0 counts as a value all the way up to 255. Since 0 counts as a value, our 256 discrete values are represented from the range 0 to 255. So if we are going to, keeping that in mind, we can now actually apply some numbers behind these axes on our, uh, on our histogram. In particular, our black region at the very far left end of this histogram represents a value of 0. And the white region represents a value of 255. And normally, a histogram actually shows you 256 discrete steps. Zooming in far enough, you can actually see now the, the jagged peaks that make this up. And if we were to count them all, we would actually be able to count 256 discrete steps, just because it so happens that a byte of, uh, of information is just so handy, as we've talked about in our discussion of uh, image files and different, uh, different things. But one of the things that this is missing is the concept of color. So we have this idea of luminance, which is measuring the relative brightness of, of things within the, within the scene. But we are totally throwing away this concept of color. Where in here does the color, is the color blue represented? Where in here is the color red represented? So let's come back to this idea of JPEGs, which are made up of three separate color components, as are many, many different types of files a red component, a green component, and a blue component at every single pixel. And the combination of these three components are what provide the wide range of colors that we see on our screen. Each one of these components, or each one of these so-called color channels, has 8 bits of value, or 1 byte of value. 
which means that each one of these can represent a range from 0 to 255. So imagine we're thinking just of the red channel just for a second. A value of 0 in that red channel means a color black. A value of 255 in that color channel means the brightest red that our computer can produce. Now similarly, if we have a value of 0 for green, that's black. The value of 255 is the brightest green, and so on and so forth for blue, and likewise. So we can have middle tones that, in combination, make up all of these millions of colors. Now, it, it might seem sort of unintuitive how we can have just 255 different values but still be able to produce millions of these different colors. But imagine that you multiply 255 times 255 times 255 to represent all of the possible combinations of these colors. And hopefully it becomes a little bit more obvious why we can have so many different values represented at an individual pixel. So just to think about this a different way, imagine what happens if in the red channel I have a value of 255. Green channel, I have a value of 0. Blue channel, I have a value of 0. That one pixel is going to be a full-on red pixel, pure red. Now imagine something else. Imagine that I have a pixel that has a value of 255, a green channel uh, value of 255, and a blue channel value of 0. This would be a combination of red and green and would be the color yellow. Perhaps an easier one to think of would be 255, 0, and 255. What would that produce? Any ideas? Full on blue, full on red. Yeah, purple, a violet. Uh, color like that would certainly be represented by that sequence of colors. So what's left? Imagine that we have um, a value of 0 for red, 255 for green, and 255 for blue. We would get a cyan color out of this by combining those two things. So in this way, we can combine these combinations of colors using more subtle variations, obviously, than just values of 255 when we're taking photographs, but it's, it's helpful to think of it in this way to understand how a computer is able to produce this color. But there's a little bit of um, problem here, isn't there? Because I just told you a second ago that a histogram shows values from 0 to 255, but at every single pixel, there's actually three discrete values for 255. So there's some way that we must shoehorn these three values into a single value that ranges from 0 to 255. So let's think about this for a second. How, what might be an, an obvious way to do this? We could just maybe average them. Just take the, the three values, average them, and plop that right in the middle. And that's certainly a reasonable way. That could be a reasonable representation of a conversion from a color uh, a color photograph to a grayscale photograph is just, color, is just to average all those colors and spit out the resulting gray value. And the reason that it's gray is that we would consider in a range from 0 to 255 of only that value, 0 would be black, 255 would be white, and all of the tones in between would be variations of gray. So we would want to average those three colors into some gray color. And that's certainly a, that, that is a reasonable thing to do, but it is not, in fact, how we view things. So is this a fair representation of this particular color? If we take these three values and just try to average them to some middle gray, is that actually going to be a fair representation for that? Well, remember that way back when in the first lecture, and this is the time that we can start stitching together all of the stuff that we've been talking about up until this point in the class. Remember way back when we started talking about the cone cells in our eyes and how we have um, three different cone cells that respond to different frequencies of light. And if we were to oversimplify it, we could say that we have some cone cells that respond to red light, some that respond to green light, and some that respond to blue light. But really, that's not quite that's an oversimplification because this, the cone cells, the M and the L type cone cells, kind of overlap a little bit. And they also are vastly more present in our eyes uh, 
than the S-type cells, which respond predominantly to blue light, which means that we are far more sensitive to green light than we are to blue light. So I want you to imagine something, just for a moment. Imagine that we have uh, three different rooms, a red room, a green room, and a blue room. And I think we might have actually even done this at the early on in the semester. But just imagine that you have three different rooms that have nothing inside of them except for a single light bulb that can spit out only a single color. So we have a red room over here, and it's completely sealed off just for a red light bulb. We have a green room in the middle, and it's only, uh, it's only green. We have a blue room that only can show blue light. If you were to walk into each one of these rooms, which one would sort of feel the brightest? You can also just sort of look here. Which one of these three colors looks the brightest to you? The green? So almost universally, people are saying green. And in some way, we might be able to say, and, and the exact amount of conversion in terms of brightness that each of these confers will be different in different people. But roughly speaking, we might say that it kind of looks like this. That green is far brighter than red and far brighter than blue. Now again, this is kind of exaggerated in this particular case. If you were to look at this slide on your computer, you might actually notice that it looks a lot, uh, a lot closer in terms of the brightness. So here, all we're trying to do is just to determine the relative brightness of these different colors. So what this tells us is that our eyes are far more sensitive to different types of colors for the relative brightness of a scene compared to other colors. And here, green is the most predominant factor when determining the amount of brightness or how bright does something feel. So at this point, we're no longer really talking about the raw experimental uh, calculation of figuring out exactly how bright something is in terms of the number of photons. But here, we're now trying to take into account our perception of the world to try to figure out how bright does something feel based on the colors that are present within that scene. And this is really important when we're trying to determine what is, in fact, the relative brightness of a pixel in that scene. If it's bright green, that's going to feel like it's brighter than a bright blue region of a photograph. So with this in mind, there is a luminosity function that roughly describes to us how important each one of these three values are when computing the, the brightness of a pixel. So we would say that, and if we go back, I'll come back to the slide, but if we say that we've uh, been doing a little bit of hand waving, saying, well, green is obviously the most, is obviously the most intense, it's obviously the brightest one. We might say in our, uh, in our equation that it is, in fact, twice as bright as the red. So it makes up roughly 60% of the intensity, of the perceived intensity of the brightness in a scene. Specifically, it's 59%, but we can roughly translate it to 60 which we will do also for the remainder of, of this class. But just keep in mind that it's really 59%. Yes? Quick clarification. This is sort of a perceived luminosity. So what you're saying is on a previous slide, each of those actually has a certain equal luminosity that we can't do. Is that right? So what we are saying, yes. Uh, so to rephrase the question, here we are talking about a perceived luminosity. So how do we perceive the brightness of a scene? Whereas in the previous slide, we were trying to make a more direct comparison to the actual brightness. So here, this, again, I want to make clear that this is, again, taking into our account our perception of the brightness here. Our eyes do not allow us to actually accurately count the number of photons that make up these different colors. Uh, and so as a result, we wouldn't say that we would be able to perceive blue as brightly as some of these other colors. And this is really just due, again, to our eyes, the fact that we do have the capability to detect far more green, uh, far more red, and especially far more green than we can these blue wavelengths. So this entire discussion revolves around our perception. And after some experiments and experiments, 
research, people have determined that on average, we might say that the luminosity of a particular scene is most heavily dependent on green, about half is dependent on red, and about a sixth as dependent on blue. So in combination, you add up 30% of red and 60% of green and 10% of blue. And again, we're just going to round to those numbers just to make this calculation a little bit easier. Then you can sort of see how if we were to make all of these values full on 100%, then we would actually perceive that as uh, the brightest possible value. Let's take a quick five-minute break, and we will see how this luminosity function actually impacts histograms. 
Welcome back. So before the break, we were looking at the luminosity computation, but I just want to provide again some context for why we care about this. Remember that we were looking at histograms earlier tonight, and we were looking at them especially in the context of trying to count tones, the tones that are contained within our image. And looking at it slightly more technically, we found that we had basically 255 discrete buckets that we could place these tones. And we were especially showing a histogram that called itself the luminosity histogram, which was attempting to show us the relative brightness of features within the image. And the luminosity histogram takes into account our perception of the world, or our perception of the brightness of relative colors. And hence, we have this computation that is then used to compute the histogram in a final way. So just think for a minute how this luminosity function might react if we actually put in some actual values for red, green, and blue. So imagine for a minute that we have all zeros for these. Then the luminosity would also be zero because it's a completely black region of the screen. Imagine that we have values of 255 for each of these. It would be 30% of 255 plus 60% of 255 plus 10% of 255, which in combination just gives us 255, or again, the maximum possible brightness, just a pure white pixel. So let's take a look at what this histogram might look like with just independent colors. So red, for instance, represents a spike about 30% of the way over because that is what this relative brightness of this color actually is, at least according to this luminosity function. So we have here uh, an image that is about, I don't know, 500 by 500 pixels, and it is made up purely of red pixels. Value of 255 at red and 0 and 0 for blue and green. And we get this histogram as a result. So there are other histograms as well that we can use that might actually show us different channels. So right now we can see in this histogram it is showing us the luminosity channel, which is then using this luminosity function to compute the histogram. But perhaps we could actually change this channel to look just at the red channel, for instance, and then we would see a spike over at the far right end. We'll talk more about different types of histograms in just a minute. But let's continue looking at just this one histogram. There's sort of this interesting idea that, that if you take this to an extreme, you might be able to say, well, you know what, now I can actually paint a histogram in some way if I were to carefully select the pixels, the tones of the pixels that I place within an image, I could perhaps get a histogram that shows me something interesting. And in fact, this is the very idea behind this website, which I forgot to load, but basically it uses an image. I know it's not on screen yet, hold on. Basically it uses an image like this, which looks like a grayscale image but each of the tones are represented in varying ways, such that once we actually show the histogram itself, we can get a skyline as a result. So this is just sort of a cute way that we can use the, Im the pixels within an image to create an image in the histogram. So if you just look at this a little bit more analytically, we can say, okay, well, there's definitely a varying level of uh, of, pic of, of pixels at each of these various tones. So we probably have a big block of relatively bright pixels. We have not so many pixels, perhaps in these middle tones compared to some of these other ones. And if you look very carefully at the original image, you can see that there are perhaps some tones that are more represented than others, even though at first glance, it looks like just a smooth gradient from black to white. And as a bonus, we can actually, for those of us here in the room, we can actually see how crappy our projector is when various tones are not actually truly grayscale. They have kind of like a green tint in, uh, in some of them. So this is also kind of a good test for uh, your computer screen. Is it actually showing you proper uh, grayscale tones? We'll talk more about properly doing color calibration when we talk about color in a few weeks' time. All right, so anyway, let's come back to this idea when we're talking about a luminosity histogram. Let's try to actually create a histogram with a slightly more complicated image. So let's use this image as an example. 
this image is 500 pixels by 500 pixels. It's scaled up for, for our purposes, but we can see that it's made up of several different regions. We have a red, a green, a blue region, a full white, a full black region, yellow, and cyan. So let's actually try to come up with what this histogram would look like if we were to show the luminosity histogram. So we have this histogram. And now let's imagine what each of these spikes would actually show. So we have a red, a green, and a blue section. Let's maybe skip those for now and look instead at the black and the white. So we have a certain number of black and white pixels here. We can actually compute exactly how many it is. Um, we can see that they are half height compared to their neighboring uh, columns. But what this really represents, and again, remember that a histogram is relative. And so we, what would you expect uh, the highest spikes to be? So which colors do you think, once placed on the histogram, would represent the highest spikes, or the tallest spikes in our histogram? Yeah, the red, the green, and the blue, because they are, in fact, the most represented here. We have so many pixels. We have a full height bar of red, a full height bar of green, a full height bar of blue. And those appear to be about twice as big as some of these other columns. And so it just so happens that those will be the full height, because that is the maximum number of pixels that we have in any one of these regions. So let's come back to these, this white and this black section because this, in fact, will be the easiest to compute. So even though we've talked about we have this luminosity function, don't forget that we talked also about how black still remains at this value of 0 because 0, uh, zero times 0.3, whoops, 0 times 0.3 plus 0 times 0.59 plus 0 times 0.1 is still going to be 0. So I would imagine that I have a spike in the far left side of this histogram that goes to the half height, because it is, in fact, only a half height number of pixels. So what about the white bar? Where do we expect that? Easy question. All the way to the right, because it is, in fact, the brightest. And again, this will be also half height. So let's come back to these red, this green, and this blue section. Where would I expect the red to be? We saw this just in the slide prior. Should be about 30% of the way over. And what should be its height? That's right, the full length, because in combination with the green and the blue, these are the pixels that are most represented in this entire image, so that is going to be the highest part of this image. So the trick is getting about 30%. We have a full height bar at about 30%. Now let's consider the green. Where should that go? About 60% of the way, so maybe about here. And what height? Yeah, full height again. So I've kind of bisected it into thirds, but it's actually 30% and 60%. And then the blue one, what should we get here? Full height bar, yeah, at about 11%, or I'm just going to round roughly to about 10%. OK, so far so good, right? Now we have some tricky ones. We have yellow and we have cyan. So what two colors, we talked about this just briefly a little while ago, what two colors are used? in combination to make a yellow pixel. A red and a green. So that means that I have somewhere a pixel with a value of 255 for red, 255 for green, and zero, oops, backwards, and zero for blue. So essentially, what I need to do is bust out a calculator and do 30% times red, 60% times green, oh, I ran out of space, and 10% times blue. 
Does anyone have a guess as to what value this will actually represent? So 30%, 0.3 times 255, 0.6 times 255. If we actually did this in terms of percentages, it might be a little bit easier to think about as well. We have a full 30%, a full 60%, so it's about 90%. If we were to do the raw computation, we would find that we get an actual value of 227. So don't forget that a histogram goes from a value of 0 at the far end, far left, all the way to a value of 255. So a value of 227 is going to be about 90% of the way over. And what height is this bar going to be for the yellow? Yeah, half height. So we'll have another half height bar at about 90%. Or to be more correct, we're going to say 227. Far right is 255. Far left is 0. We have red is 76. Oops, not that one. 76. Green is, I did all this beforehand, 150. And blue is 25. So if you want to think of it in terms of percentages, that's fine. But again, don't forget that histograms are actually computed from 0 to 255. And so that's the values that we really want to be thinking about. It's easier for us to draw a histogram when thinking about sort of percentage, because it's much easier for me to think, oh, OK, this should be a half height bar 90% of the way over from the left rather than a value of 227. But that's my fault, not a computer's fault. They would, a computer would very easily be able to create a half-height bar of value 227. So far, so good, I hope. So we have one left. This color in the lower right is cyan. So what color combination is used to make this? And let's think of it in terms purely of the red component, the green component, and the blue component. So a cyan is what color pair? Green and blue. So what does that mean for our red, green, and blue components? We have a value of what for red? Zero. We have a value of what for green? Yep, 255. And a value of what for blue? 255. So again, we perform the same computation, 0.3 times 0, 0.3 times 0, plus 0.6 times 225, plus 0.1 times 200, oh, sorry, 255, and 0.1 times 255. And we get some value, which again, I pre-computed as 178 which is more than 150 and less than 227. So it's probably going to be about here and again at a half height, 178. So just to put labels on all of these, this is the black. This is red. Oh, gosh, no, that's blue, sorry. This is red. This is green. This is the blue-green. Uh, this was the yellow or the red and green. And this is white. Now again, this is just meant to be obviously a contrived example. But in this way, you can see how a computer might be able to construct a histogram. Obviously, this is going to be a lot more complicated for photographs because every pixel is going to have a much more uh, graduated sense of all of these various color values. But in combination, we can see how this actually would be created. Now, if you took this image and plopped it into Photoshop and opened up the histogram, you would actually see exactly the histogram that we created. So go team. Good job, right? We did this. Now we understand histograms. All done. Time to go home? <sighs> Not yet. And the trick is the following. The fact that we can actually change this channel in the histogram. So we've been discussing luminosity. And luminosity is very useful 
but as you might be able to tell, it's not really super useful to tell when one of our color channels is at a value of 255, which means that we can't really tell very easily when one of our color channels specifically is overexposed, or as we would say, blown out. So imagine you take a photograph of just like a red flower. You want that flower to be really brightly red. If you're using the luminosity histogram, where would you see that spike? About 30% of the way over, right? It's not, it doesn't, sure, that, that tells you a little bit about the, our perception of the brightness of that overall image, but it doesn't tell you the intensity of the red itself. And this is the downfall of the, lumin of the luminosity histogram, is that it doesn't really show you the, the strength, the, the intensity of individual color channels, but instead how those combinations of all of those colors in aggregate show you the perception of the relative brightness of areas in the sea. So we can actually change this channel to different types of histograms. We can look at individual color channels that would then be able to show us a histogram from 0 to 255 of all of the red components for every pixel in an image. So imagine that I have this image again. It's just pure red. In the luminosity channel, we see that that has a spike about 30% of the way over, as we've been discussing and as hopefully you now understand. But imagine if we change this to look at just a histogram of those, red, of those red values, specifically, just totally ignoring the green values and the blue values. What I would see is a histogram that shows a spike all the way at the far right, because every single pixel here is in fact represented by a value of 255 in this red channel. Therefore, every pixel is made up by it, and therefore the biggest spike is going to exist on the far right side of that image. If I change this then to a green color channel, I would see a spike at the far left end because there's no green anywhere in this image. None of the pixels have a green component to them. Therefore, I will have a full height bar at zero for green. Same thing for blue. In a pure red image, in each of the individual color channel histograms, I will see spikes at those various places. So imagine a slightly more complicated image, which is this gradient, which goes from white on the far left end and then recedes to red. Did I say it backwards? White on the left end and red on the right end. It would have been a lot easier to say if I put the white on the right. But anyway, that's fine. So the luminosity histogram might be what you would expect. We would see a range of tones from about 30% represented by that red portion of the image all the way up to the brightest possible portion because of that white section. And we can see that. We can see that there's a lot of red on one side and then there's this sort of this curve that leads up to the white portion of this image in the histogram. A common question is why does it have this this curve appearance to it. Why is it not a flat bar, a flat rectangle all the way across? And the reason for that is if you look at this image a little bit closer, you can see that there's actually a pretty wide portion that is just red before the gradient begins. So there's actually relatively more pixels that are pure red and pure white in this image that are made up by the gradient itself. So this could perhaps be improved to a histogram that you might expect if I made a gradient that was absolutely perfect across the width of this image. But that's really hard to do in Photoshop. Just try it. It's like really, I tried for a long time and it still looks like this. Normally, if you, if you make a little gradient in Photoshop that's just like a little, little width like this, you would get these huge spikes at each end and then this huge dip along the middle because that gradient is not well represented in the image. Okay, so let's then look at some of the other color channels that make up this image, specifically the red color channel. 
This may, depending on your uh, interpretation, this may be a little surprising to see that there is a single spike everywhere, or rather there's a single spike at the far right end of a red color channel histogram. But again, keep in mind that when we are looking at the histograms of individual color channels, we are looking only at the values in those color channels at every pixel and throwing everything else away. So since the color white, according to a computer, is made up of red and green and blue, if we look at only that red color channel, it appears as though this image is purely red. Because essentially what we're doing in this image is adding green and blue as we go to the left. We are not, in fact, replacing red with white. And you have to think about it in terms of those components. So as a result, we then have a single spike way on the right for the red components. And because of the same thing, because we have regions of the image where there, it is fully red, there is no blue or green component, but we are adding blue and green as we slide to the left in this image, we then see these histograms out of the blue and green. There are some regions of the image that have no blue component. No, no pixel has a, uh, or rather, there, we have some image, some portions of this image whose pixels do not have a blue component because it is purely red. And again, we get that sort of curved look because it is, in fact, uh, not an evenly distributed gradient from one side to the next. How does that feel? Does that feel OK? So imagine how this would look if this was instead a gradient from red to black. What would the luminosity histogram look like in that case? It'd be the inverse of this, right? It would be from 0 to red, 0 to 30%. Cool. What about the red channel? The red channel, because there are portions of the image that are black, do those pixels have any red as part of it? Black color has no color components. So we would then see a histogram for a gradient from red to black whose red color channel goes from 0 all the way up to 255. What would the green look like? So the question there is, is there any green at all in that image? The answer is no. If it's a gradient from red to black, there's no green in that image. So we would see a single spike at the far left end of the green color channel. Same thing for blue. No blue in that image. So we would see only that. Can I say the red one again in the context of the red to black gradient? So when we are looking at a, a gradient that is from red to black, we have some portions of this image that have no red component because a black pixel is made up of no color at all. So therefore, our red color channel would look like what these green and blue ones do now. Because we have some regions of the image that have no red at all, and then it swoops up to some regions of the image that have, uh, that have red, a full 255 value for red. OK? Now, not to overwhelm, but there's actually more types of histograms. Looking at the red, the green, and the blue channels individually are useful, but perhaps only in certain cases. And specifically, those cases are when we are concerned about what is happening with those individual color channels. It sounds kind of circular, but we care about that when I'm taking a, a photograph that is predominantly focused on one of those colors. Like, for example, this, this photograph of a red flower. When I would be concerned about losing portions or losing detail of that image to some pixels that are so red that that channel is effectively overexposed or is blown out because there is no capability for the camera to actually capture additional detail. That is when I would look at these individual color channels. But really, typically, what you will see is the luminosity histogram Another histogram that is uh, 
just the addition of the red, the green, and the blue histograms combined into one and colored based on their, on their channels. This is called a colors histogram. And another, which is essentially RGB. So these are probably the histograms that you're going to encounter the most in your time with a still digital camera. Many, many cameras show the luminosity histogram, um, sort of the more advanced, quote unquote, the SLR photo cameras by default will typically show a luminosity histogram. That may not necessarily be true. Um, some show this RGB one, which is basically just the combination of the, of the three. Um, it's not an overlay of the individual co color uh, channels, but instead it is a combination of the three of them. It's a, an addition of the three of them. And some of them would show RGB. So you really have to look into your camera's uh, um, settings to try to figure out which one it's showing you by default. It, it might be luminosity, it might be RGB. Some cameras might actually have the ability to show you colors. Some cameras will show you like a whole bunch of histograms if you hit the info button enough times, you'll just get inundated with all these graphs and stuff. And until now, maybe uh, didn't really know what to do with them. But colors in RGB are useful for showing those clipped colors, those overexposed, quote unquote, individual channels in your image. Whereas luminosity is probably more useful just to get an overall sense of the exposure of the image. So let's take a look at some other, some of those photos that we looked at earlier, but with these three different histograms. So we have here, this one that we saw before, the luminosity. Remember how we had uh, in this middle graph, we had that big spike over at this far left end. I did a little bit of hand waving. Now that you see that this photo is actually made up of a lot of blue pixels, hopefully that, the location of that spike now makes a little bit more sense to you. Is that, okay, the region, the overall appearance of this photograph does actually seem to be kind of dark because of this big blue pool in the, that's, that predominates. Uh, and the RGB and colors histograms is also visible. I, I find um, the colors one a little difficult to interpret at first, um, but realize that what it is doing is it is showing you those individual red, green, and blue channels in a superposition of, of each other. And it colors them fully with those individual colors. And any overlap, you'll actually see the combination of those. So you can see small regions of this histogram where the green and the blue overlap. And you see that as a cyan. You see small regions where the green and the red overlap, and you get a yellow. And you see some regions where red and blue overlap, and that is the, the violet. So really, these additional colors are just this combination of them. It's not meant to represent that there are, it's also showing you violet pixels, though I guess since it is a combination, it is in essence showing that to you. And you can sort of see the overall gray tones as a result. So RGB is good for strong clipping for images that have very strong high preference for individual colors. Um, we can see here that I'm not really at risk of clipping any particular color. Maybe I am, but not a huge risk of, of clipping any particular individual color channel. Um, looking at luminosity as overall shows us the relative brightness or how, as, how we would perceive the brightness of that particular image. It's sort of the easiest way to tell the difference between the RGB histogram, the luminosity histogram, is to use a photograph with a very pure color, a very pure red, a very pure green, a very pure blue, because you will very easily be able to see in a very pure red photograph, if you have a spike about 30% of the way over, that that is probably a luminosity histogram as opposed to an RGB one. 
Now this, of course, you have to take into account the fact that your camera might be trying to counteract that color using some white balance. Um, but if you were to set the white balance of your camera manually and then take a photograph of some strongly red object, you might be able to get a clue as to what this is actually showing you. A couple more examples. Try not to blow out individual colors. In this case, we can actually see that there are, this is a very blue image. There's a lot of blue throughout this image. Sure, there's other colors as well, which we can actually see in the uh, colors histogram above, but we can actually see how these histograms actually look very different for the same photograph. The luminosity one reflects relatively well that it overall appears somewhat dark with some regions that are very bright over here for these overexposed sections of light. Whereas the RGB one shows us that we are, we have a pretty even distribution of uh, values, of color values throughout the image and we are perhaps at risk of, of, of clipping individual colors at the far right. But it doesn't tell us which color it is, uh, it is clipping. But we can kind of guess from looking at this, at this image that it's probably blue. Oh, come on, get it just right. OK, there. And using the color histogram, we could then see, oh, yeah, it's definitely blue that is very brightly represented here. And so there probably are some regions of this photograph where blue is clipped and therefore we have lost some quote unquote texture in the blue regions. And in fact, we can see that, especially down here where we only have essentially halos of a single color uh, around these, around these images or around that portion of the image. But again, this calls into question, like looking at these histograms, does this represent a well-exposed scene? Have I done everything that I can when I took this photograph to make sure that it is properly exposed? I mean, arguably, it's, it is a bit dark. You can't really see the background. But there was this tricky situation with the lights in the foreground. Increasing the exposure a little bit too much might blow those out even further, removing even more details. So sure, there could be tricks here of perhaps taking multiple exposures and doing a composite shot so that we can brighten the sky in the background and reduce the exposure uh, up front. And that might also, in fact, help out with these clipped regions of the image uh, for, the, for blue. Any questions on this? So there's been sort of a, a, a hint about something that we're going to be talking about in the next couple of weeks in this entire discussion. And that is that there are regions of an image that are white and, uh, and, and black. And beyond, outside of these regions, the camera cannot capture any additional detail. We've talked about this in, in different ways with overexposure and underexposure. If we overexpose regions of the image, then we're going to lose details in it because it's too bright for the sensor to be able to distinguish between different intensities of photons. But we can also formalize this idea by referring to this term called dynamic range. And here again is where our anatomy and, and our perception actually makes it difficult to be able to compare digital cameras with how our eyes actually function. So dynamic range is, is really this relative difference between the brightest regions of, of a scene and the darkest regions that we or a sensor can perceive. So the dynamic range of a scene might be the region of the scene that is most intense, has the most number of photons, is the brightest, compared to the region of the scene that is the darkest. A scene with very high dynamic range might be one, perhaps this isn't super high dynamic range, but there's a fair amount of dynamic range. There's definitely some areas of the scene that, the that was a, a larger dynamic range than what this camera was capable of capturing because there's regions that are overexposed and regions that are very dark and underexposed. So the dynamic range of the scene, the variation in the intensity of the light exceeded that of the sensor. And it's tricky because our eyes do a fantastic job of adjusting for this. 
even within the same scene, as we move our eyes around, not only uh, do the cells react to the intensity of light and impact how much how our perception of that light changes, but also we have some other mechanisms like changing the, 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 the size of the iris and such to actually have a vast amount of dynamic range capability out of our eyes. So if we have, um, if we have, if we imagine a, a dynamic range of like two to one, where some region is twice as bright as another region, there are some estimates that eyes, our eyeballs have a dynamic range of about one billion to one at sort of an instantaneous time. That's about 30 stops. That's a, uh, that's, that's a, that's a lot. Wait, that's uh I think that's total dynamic range. And um, our instantaneous di dynamic range is still a bit shorter, but still tends to exceed that of a camera. So it's about 13 stops uh, in the bright day, and, and at night it's about 20 stops, which is still, I mean, an incredible dynamic range, just based on these features of our eyes that try to adapt to the amount of light. And as we look around a scene, our eyes are adapting for the varying levels of light in a particular scene. As we go from inside of a dark room to outside in the brightest regions of day, you, you certainly know of the impact that your vision has as it adjusts for the difference in brightness. And although we have this instantaneous change in our capabilities to view different dynamic ranges, the camera doesn't. At every single pixel, the dynamic range is going to be effectively the same. So when we think about dynamic range in a camera, this is a little bit of a teaser for what we're going to start seeing next week, is that we have essentially a, an amount of light that our pixels in our sensors can collect. And beyond this amount of light, it can no longer collect any more light, and so it's just going to be impossible for it to be able to distinguish between two different intensities. And likewise, there's going to be a minimum level of intensity that we can detect. And so really, the dynamic range is the difference between this biggest signal divided by this lowest signal, the difference in these, uh, in these two values. You can sort of think of a pixel as like a bucket. It's, this is a very common analogy when we're talking about dynamic range and when we're talking about pixels. You can think of it as sort of a bucket uh, that collects rain. And if you put a whole bunch of buckets outside, for example, you can collect rain over a wide range of, of area. And you can use that to measure the, the amount of water in, in each bucket to determine how much rain fell at each individual spot. And in, here, the analogy, of course, is that rain is photons. And the, if, if this bucket overflows with water, we can no longer measure how much rain fell at that particular location because it's overflow. We just know it's beyond full. We don't know how much over full it went. And also, if it doesn't rain that much, if there's just a couple drops at the bottom of the bucket, what does that actually mean? How do we know how much water we've actually collected if that was the best capability? So too much rain, we have an overflowing bucket. It's not really readable. Too little rain, it's not really going to be within our measuring capabilities to know, to be able to differentiate between like two or three drops or something like that. So we're not really going to have resolution down there either. So really the dynamic range, we could say, is this biggest signal divided by the smallest detectable signal. And this is the dynamic range out of a sensor, but a dynamic range in a scene is important as well because the dynamic range of a scene can exceed that of the sensor or even of our eyes. But fortunately, our eyes have coping mechanisms to try to alleviate this, whereas our cameras rely on our differences in exposure to be able to do the same. Any questions on any of this? So here's a little tidbit. Um, the number of stops of dynamic range out of different cameras can, can vary pretty widely, but I think we can safely say that an approximate number of stops of dynamic range out of a digital SLR is something along the lines of 10, maybe 11 uh, stops. Some cameras have more and some cameras have less, obviously. But if we just sort of say that 
Um, digital SLRs have about 10 stops of dynamic range. We might say that compact cameras have a much lower range, maybe something along the lines of six, dynamic, uh, six stops of dynamic range. Um, older cameras and especially early camera phones just maybe had, I mean, they had crappy, crappy dynamic range, much worse than what we would actually expect. But the question that I want you to think about for next week is, why is it the case that we generally would have more dynamic range out of a digital SLR than we do out of a compact camera? Now, before you actually all go, um, we have, uh, this is now week six, and for the first time, I'm very, I'm very pleased to say that we uh, have uh, a student who is going to be showing a photo for in-class critique. So hopefully those of you that are doing sections are actually showing images there and, and getting critiques live in, in sections. Um, if not, you will certainly have an opportunity to do so in the future as well. But this is meant to supplement the critiques that you're getting online as well. So there's certainly something to be said about the, uh, the critiques that you can get from others when you, uh, in a text-based format, but it's also, I think, pretty instructive to have a, have a bunch of people collected in one area, like here in this classroom or perhaps during section, and be able to go into a little bit more depth on a specific image. And so just as a reminder, we're hoping that all of you will not only participate in the online critiques, but also be sure that you participate at least in one section or lecture-based critique as well. So be sure that you take a look at the website for more information on that if you haven't seen that. Um, but we have, um, we have one student, Tom, uh, who, uh, you want to come up here, Tom, and who, who submitted an image for us to critique today. So we're just going to spend the last few minutes talking about this image. So Tom, thank you very much uh, for doing this. And this is the image I haven't I actually made a point not to look at this before class so that we would be able to look at this uh, uh, at this at, at sort of live as we're doing this. Um, but generally the way that, that this will work is, um, you know, Tom, I'll have you describe a little bit about the image, maybe anything in particular that you're looking for feedback on. Um, I'll try to say a couple of words, and uh, if anyone else has some input as well, I think we might only have one mic now. This is... Uh, a little last minute, but I'll run up to you and try to uh, get your feedback on this image as well. So, okay. Tom, if you wouldn't mind. Well, yeah, you might just stand close and, okay. and talk. <laughs> yeah, my name's Tom, thanks. Uh, you were right when you said this problem set was a doozy, or this yeah. project was a doozy. Uh, it took me probably until two days ago to get a decent image, and this obviously still has a lot of work left. This is one of the best ones I think I've got. Um, I decided on doing the long-term exposure. I just like this idea of integrating all those photons over a long period of time. And this is a picture of me watching Lecture 5, I guess, in my Airbnb here in Cambridge. <laughs> it's here for a conference. And it's an hour and 45 minute exposure. Um, it took a long time to get the settings right. Um, it's like F22, ISO 100. Um, all the lights in the room are off. But even at that, even at the lowest um, like ambient light with my computer at the lowest setting, that still was blowing it out after about 10 minutes. So I found this app called like Screen Shader, which allows you to very finely control the brightness of your screen, and that saved me. Um, I do have a lot of issues with noise. Um, ISO 100, I don't know what temperature makes an effect, whatever, but um, even after an hour and 45 minutes, I did a little bit in Photoshop to try to clean it up, but uh, actually it's not so visible here. Well, you can see it up there a little bit, but there was quite a bit of noise. So I'm interested in what you think of this. Um, it's, I thought it was interesting because Dan, he's like this ghost on the side, right? Because you got to imagine, you were looking at the whole class integrated for 100, well, how many minutes? One hour and 45 minutes, so over 100 minutes, right? And whatever's happening on that screen is being put into this single image. So there was a few bright slides you have, like the ones we see on the side with the white, and you're over here in the, like just you talking, you tend to, the camera follows you, you see so you're pretty much exposed. Right? Mm -hmm. um, couldn't tell it was you, obviously. But um, there's a lot of other things. It looks like maybe reflections on the screen, but it's really not. Those are like other things that happen to come on for a minute or two. There's a video in this one. Mm -hmm. um, different things like that that came on. And I don't know. It's kind of a 
cool idea. I still got a lot of technical things to like execute it, but uh, that's pretty much it. Thanks. I, I like it. I, it's interesting that the, the camera work is so uh, consistent that you can actually see me in the middle for, uh, for a minute 45. So maybe that means I should move a little bit out of frame. No, Ian, don't move. OK. No, I'm just kidding. But also that, yeah, it is interesting that there's um, the, the, like the ghosts of the, of the slides. Like one of the, the slides that, I, that seems to be predominant that I didn't really expect was the circle of confusion one, which sort of indicates that it's like, oh, this is a, that was maybe one of the ones that were brightest or that was most obvious. Um, over the entire duration. Anyway, I'm getting too a little bit too meta here, talking about uh, reflecting on the uh, on the lecture rather than on the image itself. Um, the noise. So the so I do see the noise like around the the side, and especially is this noise here on this side, or is that texture no, that's, that's a, on the wall? A uh, towel I put on top of my suitcase to kind of just make it look a little bit nicer. Um, it's actually a towel. OK. Yeah. Interesting. I thought this was kind of cool, the, the light of the plug. Yeah, that has a lot of, that has a very high number of uh, rays from, from that star. I think um, when I first saw the image, it looks like, if I step over here for a second, is it level from one side to the next, from here to here? Or is it slightly off? Because I can imagine that getting the angles just right with the screen, get it properly uh, perpendicular to the to the to the image, and also making sure that everything is squared up is probably pretty hard here. It was I had to tilt the screen up a little bit so that I wouldn't get a reflection from the keyboard on the screen. Um, but yeah, it does tilt a little bit on the top. I might try that again tonight. Okay. Yeah. So uh, a concrete comment about the noise. If so. I think the, the noise is pretty obvious along, like the, especially the solid colored regions. Um, many cameras do this automatically, except when we do very long exposures like this, which is that they take uh, a second exposure that is the same length at the same setup, but with the shutter closed. And that's, that's a, it's just a black image. But what that shows is that is all the, the same pixels that become hot and showed variance in their exposure are then actually shown in the second uh, in the second exposure. And the camera will then automatically subtract that black image from the first image to try to remove the variance in the noise as a result. But I'm guessing with a duration of this long, the camera didn't do that. It probably immediately stopped and then you could see the image, or did you have to wait another hour and 45 minutes for it to? I don't have that option on my camera. Yeah. And I'm glad I don't because the battery would have died. Right, right, right. I've got about three hour battery life, and I don't think it could have processed that. Yeah, so, so. but you might try doing it yourself. Okay. You might try to uh, fake it by putting it in a very dark, I, I don't know how well this will work, um, but you can try to fake it by putting it in a very dark room or area, closing it in a box of some kind and just set the bulb to even something like an hour or something like that. Um, and then take that subsequent dark frame and then in Photoshop layer, layer it on top and just subtract the two. It's possible to do that. Um, doing that might then remove some of the most noticeable noise that's here. Um, but then again, maybe not. Maybe it also would have, there could, this could be problematic if there's a, a break in the seal there, there, uh, and even a little bit of light leakage into this, um, into this dark box, then you would actually subtract out perhaps a little bit more light than necessary. But that might be one way that you could try to combat the, the noise. Um, the other way is to, um, there are software solutions that, that try to combat the noise, um, but I don't think that that's, I don't think that it's bad enough um, to do that. So it's, it's actually, uh, it's, it's pretty interesting. There are a lot of features that are really, if you look at this, they're really neat. The, the slider bar is of course red when it starts here. Right. And it gradually goes through the picture. So it's darker red here and it's lighter red there. Just yeah. As that, the as that, yeah, as the that grew over time. Kind of all messed up. Yeah. The timer especially looks pretty, um, pretty fascinating. Yeah. So. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Does, any, does anyone have any comments on this? Suggestions on how to uh, do something else? Or?
But the question was how to keep the shutter open. Yeah, I just have a bulb and I bulb mode and just pushed it. Um, this was about 1.30 in the morning, so I set my timer and I slept for an hour and a half and then <laughs> came up. Yeah. It was many tries. I heard the lecture like seven times. <laughs> well, I'm, hopefully you know that stuff really well now. Um, but so, did, so you had an external remote that you were able to lock into an open shutter position or? Yeah, I just put it into the, the camera. It's a little cord about a meter long mm -hmm. and I just lock it on and then pull it up when it's over. Awesome. Any other questions or? All right, well, thank you, Tom, so much. Thank and uh, thank you all for coming. We will see you uh, next week.